meeting on Thursday, August 13th. And with that, I'll call the meeting to order. Liam, I don't know if you've got any instructions for the members that are in the audience about if they want to raise their hand or communicate with us, how would they do so? Or Tom, I, you've been to this room a couple of times. I don't know. Yeah, I'll do it. I, the only attendee right now is our cable guy. So, um, you know, I, but certainly anyone could raise their hand. There is a uh, spot on the agenda, item five for public comment. So uh, Chairman Hayes will... Uh, indicate at that point when people, uh, you know, public comment will be received, raise your hand and we'll invite you in and allow you to make your comment audio only. So with that, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, and with that, uh, let's, we'll make a note of who's present and all the committee members are present or along with Ruth Porter, Liam Gallagher, Tom Hall, and a guest panelist, Don Hamill. Um, we have item three, which is the approval of the minutes. I, for some reason, I couldn't access them today, but that's, yep. did, you, did, you, did you get the minutes or did you get a chance to see the minutes and review them? And if you are, do you have a motion to approve them? Or should we table the minutes? I, I'll come I, back to them. I think you should table them. I couldn't find them myself. So I suspect they were okay. not available. So. Okay. We'll, we'll table them. Betsy, you're on mute. <laughs> so with that, I apologize. We do have a pretty long, a lot of agenda items. Hopefully we can kind of move through them quickly. Um, I think the first agenda item, which was really kind of one of our council goals was to kind of quarterly review the statements. This is an early draft of the year end financial statements. Um, and I know Tom and Ruth are here. They usually prepare for us um, an executive summary, which was part of the package. Um, and with that, I had some questions on them today. Um, I know some others may have had some questions. So Ruth, I don't know if you wanna kind of walk us through your executive summary of just the highlights, telling us things that we might wanna know, and then we can kind of have any, blow up any questions from there. Would it be helpful for Liam to share a screen and bring that up or, sure. or yeah, not? Sure, yeah, okay. if he could, sure, absolutely. All right, Ruth, why don't you start in? So as of the end of June 30th, we've gone through quite a COVID-19 session in this past quarter with uh, staff, uh, part-time staff being laid, partly laid off and then full-time staff going down to 20 hours for a short period of time. We are, um, as of July, as of today, the full-time staff are back and I'm some of the part-timers are also back. Um, in terms of where we are for the end of the quarter and the end of the year, uh, we issued this past year in May a $7 million bond, bond to cover some of our capital items. And then we were notified by our financial ad municipal advisor that the timing was pretty good for us to refund or advance refund some of our current bonds. So we did that. We re advance refunded our 2010 through 2013 bonds. The total we refunded was about 43,355,000 and we reissued 42,315,000. So we saved about a million dollars in principal payments and over the life of the bonds, we will have also saved an additional $2.4 million in interest costs. So, um, you know, I think that was a pretty good process for us to go to. It was pretty hectic, but I think we kind of made it through there okay. I think in overall the town has done pretty well in terms of our um, because of some of the reductions that we did with the furloughing of staff and the part-timers and Tom had instituted a uh, curtailment order, the town is right now at about 93% of budget and we're about 93% in terms of revenues collected. So we're right about even revenues and expenditures. When uh, we were closed for a couple of months, folks couldn't register their vehicles. So the revenue staff downstairs essentially came in and 
worked almost nonstop registering vehicles for folks. And since it's the second largest revenue source for the town, you know, we really wanted to make sure that our revenues were accurately reported within each fiscal year. So we kind of tracked all of the reven uh, excise revenues that we collected in July that really pertain to the prior year. And we are booking those revenues. So that turned out to be uh, about a, no, I don't know if I wrote it in. I think it ended up being about 117,000. In terms of where we stood at June 30th, we actually received the actual amount we budgeted, plus we made an additional 55,000 more. So I think overall for our excise collections, we did pretty well in spite of all of the COVID-19 conditions. Building <laughs> permits exceeded their estimates by 33,000. Plumbing and electrical also did. Parking violation revenues are also up. We also received more state revenue sharing than what we had originally budgeted by about $130,000. I'm not sure that we will see that again next year. However, those addition, uh, those funds are only used to reduce the property tax. So those monies will help to reduce FY21's property taxes. Tax collections through June 30th are at 98.9%. So, you know, that's a pretty good collection rate. As of July 31st, we were at 99.2%. So uh, taxes, taxes did very well also. So um, I did want to thank Larissa, our uh, former assistant town manager as uh, she was very helpful in organizing the sta uh, the citizens in terms of when they came in. Plus she took quite a few who were unfamiliar with the rapid renewal excise process and helped them to register their vehicles online. So that was uh, very helpful to the finance staff working on those. Just if I could, uh, just as a footnote, uh, several years ago, we put a couple of uh, kiosks, workstations up in the excise uh, revenue office. And the hope and intent was that folks coming in to do their business, you know, standing in line could just hop on a terminal and do their business. It did not take off. What, what I guess I learned with this experience this spring is it would be great if we could have someone, and it might be an existing staff member, I'm not suggesting a new staff member, but someone to kind of work that line and to assist people. It's remarkable. People are surprised how easy it is. And, you know, we would love to train as many people to do things online as possible. It's better and easier for them and it's easier on staff as well. So that's something we're going to think about and, and uh, find a way to rotate people uh, as our time permits uh, out to work the crowds and, and help them to do things online so they can do it in the future as well. Plus it's safer for them if they're not here doing their registrations. Uh, let's see, so where else? The town has a fund balance policy and the goal is to maintain fund balance equal to 10% of the prior year operating budget. So for FY, the FY20 budget, the goal was 8.8 .8 million. So for FY21, it should be 9.4 million. So um, I think we're probably not going to make that this year, but our goal is to try and get to that point. So. Some of the negative indicators that we have, um, because, can, uh, because of the whole COVID situation, community services had to essentially cancel many of their summer programs, which meant that on one hand, we had some savings and expenditures, but it also meant that we had some lost revenues and our lost revenues were about $800,000. So that was a pretty big hit. Uh, they anticipate we can do summer programs this coming year uh, that we will make some of that up. And then the general assistance costs. Uh, 
um, were overspent by about 60,000. We did anticipate having some revenues come in and they are coming in. We're missing uh, right now May and June's revenues. So the deficit there uh, probably won't be as large as what it shows here. I know that was one of the questions uh, Councillor Hayes had and uh, we're about 59, about 60,000 overspent right now we're over collected because we didn't estimate as many revenues by about 23,000 and we still need to collect May and June's revenues. So, and I'm not sure what that number is. I did have a call into the uh, general assistance person, but I haven't heard back from him yet, so. Yeah, and I just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jim. Is it a straight percentage uh, that we're reimbursed for general assistance? Um, there are two percentages based on certain factors. I don't really remember what the percentages were. John, I can answer that. Um, so uh, the town of Scarborough receives a 70% reimbursement from the state on our GA expenditures, which is related to uh, the performance and, and audits. And so if you're essentially in good standing and compliant, you're eligible for that increased percentage. And that's what Scarborough has historically been eligible for. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, I, I just wanted to clear up. So I think in the detail you provided to that, trying to understand that we had budgeted for the year about a net cost of 33,600. Is that right? Is that where we thought we were going to be net in the budget? No, net would have been, uh, the budget was 33,6 and we estimated revenues of 11,690. So the difference between those two would have been about 20, 22,000 maybe, the net would have been 22. So so we thought the net was gonna be 22 and what you've responded without the receipts for May and June, our net's about 59, right? Correct. At this point. So it, it's really, it, it's, it, it's a delta of about, what, 37,000? 37, you know, plus less the, uh, whatever we get for May and June. Okay. All right. And what do we budget? Is that, are we going to be okay next year in the budget, Tom, you think, and what we budgeted? I think so. We, you know, we did have some unique unexpected experience in FY20 and that's, you know, what you're seeing the effect of it there. Yeah. I, I do believe we took that into account in FY21 uh, and have carried forward what we know. So I, I don't expect there'll be this great a variance. Um, okay. you know, Scarborough yeah. historically has been shockingly low in this regard, uh, comparatively, um, for reasons I can't quite explain, to be honest. But, um, you know, but having said that, you know, a, a couple of families can move to different community or their situation changes and they come off the tax, uh, the general assistance yeah. rules as well. Okay. So it, it's a bit hard to predict, but I think, um, I think we did learn from FY20 and are appropriately budgeted in 21. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've estimated for FY21 approximately $86,000 for uh, general assistance this year. That's the straight expenditures. It doesn't include any revenues. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, I mean, to just this is just one subject I, I probably can speak to. And uh, I think that you, through the budget process, we commented on, uh, you know, I think the, the budget itself went up uh, a few hundred percent trying to capture an account mm -hmm. for what that updated experience yeah. is. So. Yeah, I remember that conversation. So, okay, great, thank you. Uh, the other two areas where we had some over expenditures had to do with legal and uh, employer insurances. And the legal was over expended by about 207,000 and the overall total employer insurances was over by about 800, and, or we spent 813,000 and we budgeted less than that. So about a hundred and something thousand less than that. And uh, most of that had to do the, the over expenditure of about a hundred and something thousand had to do mostly with workers' compensation. I, I can also speak to legal. Um, we did have some unique experience, uh, a fair amount of it. Well, I, I should say I do have a, an accounting from Bernstein Shore, our primary attorneys, on occasion, particularly for assess board of assessment review, we do use outside counsel uh, if there's a conflict. And there, there, are, there have been a number of big cases 
So in, included in that overage is expenses beyond Bernstein Shore, but at least from Bernstein Shore's involvement, the sorts of things we have uh, experienced this past year is about $100,000 in costs related to the final closeout of the Petron case. Uh, that was the tax appeal lawsuit. Um, the lion's share of that 100 was is related to the Piper Shores exemption matter, uh, which has been resolved. Uh, we also had a fair amount of ordinance development costs. The marijuana ordinances involved a lot of legal support. Um, and you know that that's kind of unique in that regard. I did note in the accounting here, uh, there'll be some reimbursements that will offset this. Uh, the Bessie TIF, um, you're seeing all the expenses related to that. Uh, those those legal our legal expenses will be covered by the applicant, so uh, we'll get reimbursement for that. And Ruth, I noticed the general obligation bond related matter. I want to make sure that that wasn't covered through cost of issuance uh, in some other way. So there'll be some adjustments here. Um, uh, Tom, will those adjustments flow into this audit, this fiscal year, or will they flow into next year's budget? No, we'll make the adjustments back in FY20 to make sure that okay. they properly reflect. If we know, okay. um, if we know what the Bessie TIF uh, reimbursement amount is, we can book that as a receivable back to last year. Um, okay. And in terms of uh, the bond costs, yes, those are usually those usually show up under the debt service budgets. So, so just as a quick question of which I couldn't, I deciphered some of it from the questions, but so where do we think as we sit today in these financial statements in front of us, where did the municipal budget end up as a surplus or deficit and where did the school budget? I think, I think you said the school budget ended up with a net surplus if you or fund balance of 1.5 million is that is that right um that's what we're showing well that's what i'm showing right now i i know that kate like like myself we're both still working through year-end processes so uh depending on where they are with their revenues i know some of their revenues were short i'm not sure if they're gonna those are gonna be made up or not uh, but i also know she's still working through some of her wage accruals and uh, benefit accruals so those will reduce that number. Yeah, I would also note uh, item later on your agenda, the COVID funding for schools. I was looking through some of that material. Uh, costs are eligible starting in March of 2020. So presumably there are costs that are being shown in their year end figures that they may be able to seek reimbursement for. The other critical thing about that funding is it must be spent by the end of December this year. So. Um, I suspect, or if I was them, I would be looking to book some of those eligible expenses back to last year to make sure I maximize and use as much of that award as possible. So I think there's, on the school side, there'll be some things in flux because of that. So do we, so do we know where the town ended up or on these financial statements just from revenues versus expenses? Because Tom, I think you are anticipating a pretty sizable surplus that you roll back into the budget for next year. I just wanted to make sure we're on track for what you thought you were going to have versus where we landed. Yeah, as I recall, and I, forgive me, I, I didn't educate myself on this. Uh, I uh, initially, I think I was looking at about a seven hundred thousand seven hundred thousand dollar year end fund balance. Yeah. Uh, in the end, we brought that back to four hundred. Yeah. Where we ended. Yeah, I'll let Ruth speak to where we are and what needs to be done to finalize that number, I guess. Are we close? I guess that's my question. Are we close to what you anticipated? Yeah, I think we uh, will be close. There are quite a few interfund adjustments that have not been, uh, that aren't reflected here. Those will be coming as we get into the other funds, as we try to close those out on June 30th for June 30th. So for example, um, I'm showing for the general fund, the town, we're, as of July 31st, when we ran these reports, we were spent, had spent $39.5 million, and we only collected about $37.4 million. However, there's about $3 million worth of uh, other, financing, other financing sources that we need to uh, still record. So. Uh, I think that will help offset that what looks like a pretty 
big difference between actual revenues and actual expenditures. Peter, let me so, say this. I'm glad we downgraded that in the kind of the final hours of the budget process. I, I don't think we would have reached the seven, but um, I hear what Ruth's saying, but I'm based on our revenues and, ex and expenditures experience, I think we're going to make budget in that regard. And just, um, and I don't know how John or, or Betsy feels, but for future, future that future presentations of the financial statements for us, is there a way that, that that's really easy for us to kind of ascertain, just quickly look at it, where we think we're landing um, for both the municipal and school budget as we typically look at it, what, what did we anticipate for revenues? What do we anticipate for expenses and where are we? I, I just had a hard time teasing out those numbers. I don't know if John and Betsy did. Yeah, yeah. so I think what you're suggesting is just add a budget column. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I would support that. I think it makes sense. Ruth, do you understand the request and can we accommodate? So what we're really looking at is uh, we have the appropriations and the expenditures. You're looking for a balance column for revenues and expenditures, and then just a quick summary of actual revenues to actual expenditures. Yeah, yeah. just so we know how we're tracking. So when Tom says 700 or 400, we can quickly look, future future finance committee members can look at it and just say, yeah, we're, we're in good shape. Mm -hmm. yes. And then the only other thing that I had just to kind of follow up to the later conversation on the unaudited school fund balance. And I apologize to the audience because this was in a subsequent um, summary or reconciliation. I thought after they took $700,000 that they were gonna apply to 21, that they didn't have a lot of surplus left, but this, again, I understand there's a lot of adjustments, but the number of net of 1.5, that's larger than we thought, isn't it? When we were having the budget conversations? Um, or am I interpreting that? Incorrectly? No, my, my recollection, Peter, is Kate was very Conservative. concerned about any conversation around this, but she had numbers approaching 2 million, as I recall. And she, of course, qualified it six ways to Sunday. Uh, but I'm not surprised to see this number because I, I recall her projecting something even higher than that. They were able to, to garner some pretty significant savings in operations and transportation and food service. Um, so they were able to book some pretty good savings as a result of their closure all spring. They weren't able to actually save too much in food service costs. Um, no. They're actually trying to, uh, because they continued to pay their staff even, and they had food uh, meals prepared. So they're looking at, but they didn't get any revenues in. So they're looking at about a $459,000. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Deficit for food services. And then a smaller, about $12,000 deficit for adult debt that the school's general fund will have to make up. And I've already taken those into account because at one point I originally had an audited net of about a $2.1 million. So with those adjustments and our, it was less than that, but uh, so. But, so they're at about a foot one point four, right? So, but that, but you've already accounted for the set. I know we have lots of conversations. You've already applied the seven hundred they were going to use, correct? To mm -hmm. this, and this would suggest before and under understood there's going to be adjustments, but there's a, an additional one point five, right? Potentially, potentially, unless there's something that I'm missing. Yeah, okay. Okay. So those would just be helpful sort of numbers for us just to see as we go through it. So Betsy and, and John, do you have any questions on the financial statements and comments or clarification? On the page that you just had up, Ruth, you showed this um, school special revenue fund that had nothing budgeted, but um, had a little over half a million dollars in it. What, what goes into that fund? The 531-388. Um, under other school fund revenues and then fund okay. 72XX. Yeah. Um, um, so what that is, is, yep, yeah, right there. The other school fund revenues. Oh, the 531, that's um, like entit local entitlement or um, Title I, Title II, the, some of the schools, federal programs. Okay. And that's what they spent. And hopefully there are, um, that's what they've received, but hopefully up 
under other school fund expenditures are where the expenditures are. Okay. That's it. John or Don, do you have any questions? I'm sorry. Can sure. you back up a second, Peter, to um, what you asked for for that budget column. Um, and can you show that again? And and can you just explain to me one more time what, what you were going to add based on that um, on that request? Um, maybe Ruth, you can go back. Uh, well, if you stay on the screen, Liam, if you can yeah. stay on the screen, what this screen kind of shows for the funds we could kind of do for the town and the school right now all we show on the town and school is the revised the expended and i think the percentage but okay. we can add the available budget or a or a net budget column in there for the school in town and then maybe below that show something that says here's your actual revenues here's your actual expenditures this okay great yeah that's what i thought so it's kind of more like this layout right right okay thank you yeah, Betsy, I think it was just trying to get <clears throat> for us to be able to very quickly look at this page and just say, you know, what is what is what is for the town the difference between revenues and, and budget, and do we have a surplus or deficit? So we kind of can monitor that in the same with the school. Right. Yeah, and I think we've probably I think we've talked about it before, right? So that'll be a, a good thing for FY anyone going forward. That would be helpful. Thank you. We can do that. Don, did I see your hand up? Yeah, I had, uh, if I may, I had a couple of uh, things, a couple of comments and just a quick question or two, but yep. I wanted to thank, uh, you know, Tom and staff, uh, you know, for their efforts uh, and, you know, and congratulate them for the performance on collections. Uh, you know, you referenced the numbers for tax collections and excise taxes. Those those are impressive, and I know that stuff really doesn't happen by itself. I, you know, I witnessed the staff assisting people when they were uh, standing in line to pay excise taxes, and I have to say, you know, this was very, was very effective. So I know that doesn't happen by itself, um, but uh, you know, but thanks, thanks to you for that. But I had two quick questions. One, you know, that really are kind of, you know, one process, one kind of forward looking. You know, the process question is. Uh, you know, this is great to see the financials for, you know, for the full year, but is, is there a way for us to try to make this more, uh, and this is a, you know, commit question for the committee and also for the council to, to make it more of a, of a recurring process rather than ad hoc. I know we've gone, we've worked really hard to try to build this into something that's just a recurring automatic thing, reviewing financials, but is there, you know, is there some way we could try to work on that moving forward to just make sure it, it happens, you know, rather than us having to chase it, you know, as a committee and a council. Uh, so there's that, you know, that question I would just ask, so. Don, I, I would say from a committee's perspective, I think we've fallen into a fairly regular routine in that regard. I think what we have not been able to do is to meet the council's goal this year, which is to, to broaden the audience, to do that with a full council. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it does occur to me that this presentation is hard to get through, and I, I fear some challenges doing it that uh, larger platform. So, uh, you know, we're open, wide open to suggestions as to how to simplify the information to make sure yeah. people are able to get what they're interested in. Yeah. And that's a real challenge. Uh, that's a, a fair point. Tom, I, that's a fair point. I appreciate the feedback. One thing I'd suggest, I know, and Peter, you know, knows this full well, we have in the past used the, we tried to use this dashboard or, or something that would be more of kind of like a flash report a one pager. So, you know, maybe there's something like that. I know it's more work that, you know, it's not going to put itself together, but that, that's something I think would be very helpful because it would be good to get the council in the rhythm, you know, better in the rhythm with the finance committee on this, you know, particularly as we have things that are going to continue to come over the transom for us. But, but thanks. A good, a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, and, and maybe Don, maybe, you know, leave it to, to Ruth and Tom, Liam, to think about, to get to your point, maybe we should just have a certain interval after the quarter end that there's there's a date certain that at least some draft of the financials are available, that maybe there's an easy summary or at least the executive summary is pretty easy to digest, kind of. The way we try to set it up is here's the positives, here's some negatives. So maybe if we could ask, you know, the team to kind of what would they be comfortable to committing to after quarter end to get some of that information out. So we, at least we've got four sources 
you know, Marford's in the calendar, if that makes any sense. I don't know how John has to feel about that. Does that make any sense? So I, in terms of like the one pager that Don was talking about, I think that's a great idea. Just so that it's easy for the council to consume. Yeah, we you know we met our budget and school met their budget or didn't. And th these are the high level things that were off. Um, it, it, in terms of the frequency, yeah, I mean, I, I know Ruth publishes is this quarterly and has for quite some time. I don't, I don't know that it's always with the same cadence. Um, so that's something that I, I think I would support working towards. What I don't fully understand is these are unaudited and still in process. So I don't know how, how much they change from here over the next month. Um, so that, that's, I guess, a question mark for me that you might want to think about before you formally publish them. Yeah, Peter, you'll, you'll recall this, I think, because you've got the longest time. It, it occurs to me, you serve finance every one of your years on council. Yeah, right? I think so. Yeah. So for the first couple of years of your tenure, I would say we kind of work collaboratively with uh, the finance committees and staff to come up with different reporting formats. Yeah. And that's yeah. the product of what you see here. Yeah. Again, it's a work in progress. We're open to suggestions. And then you in particular as finance chair several times through those years, uh, once the finance committee has presented this material, you've made a very good point through your committee reports or liaison reports uh, to supply to the council. What I think we're talking about now is to do something, uh, the next step, I suppose, which would be not just council, but more importantly to the public as well. And that's a routine that we, I think, need to give some more thought to, to how to do that so it's actually useful uh, information for folks. Don, is that... Although Tom, I just want to make it clear with Don, Don, was that your thought that it was public facing or town council facing? Well, I think it really needs to be both. I think the thing is, uh, you know, if it's in front of the council and the council has a chance to talk about it, react to it, comment on it, I think that by nature will help to kind of keep the, the public clued in. Um, but I, I don't think there'd be any harm in us also trying to communicate to the public uh, you know, and I know we we're, we're getting some great traction through our efforts in the communications committee. So I just, these, these are just, you know, standard things that I've, you know, I've seen in other places where if you build it in and it's a, it's a discipline, then it really is to get into sort of a, a cadence where you expect it and it's easy to review and, you know, it just keeps it top of mind without, and keeps it at a level of, you know, a, a higher level. So we're not getting bogged down in, you know, minute details on things uh, as a council. And, and I think also as a public, the pe people will, will hone in on issues as they, as they wish that'll continue to happen. But, but I think it wouldn't hurt for us to do both, but I think if we start with the council, then there ought to be some nice, you know, waterfall effect, hopefully for the public. And we do like John, uh, Councillor Clucci said that we do put these out on the finance department's website. Uh, on the town's web. However, I don't think we've done it recently because we've got the new uh, web pages and I don't think we know how to do that yet. So that's a, an in-process piece, but these will probably be one of the first ones that go up once we figure out how to do that. We'll get you that training, Ruth, I promise. <laughs> so maybe for the next topic, maybe for the next finance committee meeting, um, you know, you guys make, you know, would it be possible to come back with sort of the one change we talked about, just that, you know, the, the, the columns we talked about, and then maybe give some thought about what a one pager might look like that could be disseminated to the town council and also something that could go to get to Don's point to the public, but I do understand not, you know, not all of these pages and all of this information, and I don't, don't know what that would look like and i know you guys have, a, have had a lot on your plate but if that works if not we can take it up at future i'm quick i'm quick to agree but i i feel you know it's really ruth's uh, heavy lifting there so i uh, why don't you let us collaborate as staff and we'll i can report back to you um you know shortly on that yeah peter um yeah. I, I had a comment on that i i think i'm hearing people say you know kind of like something that that could be regularly um discussed at council high level, uh, you know, we're in August um, right now. So, you know, I'm almost wondering, and, and even if it hasn't gone through finance first, I'm not sure that that needs to be a barrier to it, but, you know, if we could set four times a year um, that a council would have this information at a high level and have it say, 
it'll be on an August, uh, August meeting agenda. It'll be on a November meeting agenda, you know, so two months after the um, fiscal year yeah. close. That, so people could kind of say, okay, I'm gonna see these, um, the council talk about these in August, November, uh, I believe May would be two months after um, the quarter end. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't, can't think of the other one, <laughs> April or May, um, but you know, I mean, you could always set it up and try it. And if there's reasons why that doesn't work, then um, we, we could always we could always back off of it. But if if, we, if it's not a regular feature and it doesn't get you know put on the agenda as a policy, I think it is easy to let it slip because so much else goes on. Yeah, Councilor Gleisting, what you describe, I believe, is in fact what your what your one of your town council goals for the yes. year. And uh, as we all know, this spring kind of took us in a different direction. So we're trying to recalibrate and get back on track here. We could do that as of perhaps the second council meeting of each of those four months. That'd and be great. Then right. we know specifically, I'm not sure we could do it as of the first council meeting, mostly right. because it, it might just be too soon. So if possible, I think Tom, you'd offered maybe the next finance committee meeting or the one after you guys could come back, mm -hmm. kind of incorporating well, we just discussed, John, are you okay with that? Does that seem reasonable? Okay. Also, uh, if you have any specific suggestions or ideas, you know, send them to us and, and we can work to incorporate them too. I'll put, I'll say this one out loud, but a big part of what I'm doing is holding up the, uh, the year to date revenues and expenditures and just adding up. Okay. So on the town, how did I balance out? Right. How did I balance out? Kind of what Peter was saying. It might help to just have a total. Um, a combined, you know, revenue and expense total. Maybe total have. Yeah. Thanks, John. You you said it a little much more clearly than I did. I, I was doing the back and forth, adding up, and kept getting different answers. So, yeah, that'd be really helpful. Councilor Clucci, I wonder if we could um, use you. I, I've just always been impressed with your ability to present complex information in a real simple format, and that's a that's a real skill. So. If you're willing, we might draw upon your expertise in that regard, so we can get a I would be happy to help. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else have anything? Uh, I know we got lots of other items here. Um, the next item was the CEA policy. Um, I know this is Tom. You want to give some background? This has <laughs> been through multi multiple committees and multi sort of red line versions and kind of where we are at this point in time. And really yeah, I, I wish I could put a stake in the ground, but it's probably nearing two years of review uh, from kind of the germ of an idea through multiple committees, as you say. And it's my recollection, looking back at the notes, um, that you know now it's firmly before this committee. Uh, Rules and policies uh, is the one that began with this committee, with this policy, passed it on to you. And there's been a fair amount of changes and uh, I guess one point we should talk about is whether those changes are substantive and whether you want to send it back to the other committee. I'm not looking to prolong this whatsoever but I just want to respect those that have had involvement. I, I suppose it doesn't matter because either those folks are off council or they're currently on council and we'll see it in its final form anyway. So um, uh, beyond that, I, I think the biggest change most recently really came from Councillor Gleistein's comments. Uh, she's introduced, um, you know, the concept of assessment criteria, and that really, in my mind, and that's what's shown here as a highlighted text, I think all the other changes through the multiple iterations have been incorporated, if you will, and these are the final changes from my perspective. Uh, I did take some time today and went back through it and and uh, do have a couple of comments uh, going through this, and I'm, but they're really related to the substantive changes that are being proposed. So I'm pleased to hold those until you jump into that conversation. Um, I guess I would uh, also observe this policy is specific to economic development TIFs and credit enhancement agreements. And as we uh, know, we're currently dealing with an affordable housing TIF in front of us. And so there has been at least conversation around and a decision, frankly, not to go into the area of affordable housing in this policy, but it does beg the question, should there be a separate companion policy regarding those as well? Um, so I, I guess I'll stop there and, uh, and I'm pleased to offer some comments as you take up the substance. Uh, 
Councilor Glacey? Yeah, so Peter, um, since the um, scoring criteria was uh, added, I just wanted to add a, a couple of quick uh, points on that. And sure. I think that's something you wanted to add. Um, so first of all, it doesn't really need to be in here um, as section three, it doesn't, it doesn't really hurt to have it here. Um, but uh, it, there, it is in an appendix. And then um, where it really needs to be, there are two major things that need to happen to it. Where it needs to, um, in step four, under section four, uh, it, um, it needs to be referred to here um, that the town council, town councilors individually will complete the, um, the point review. And then the, um, the other thing that needs to happen with it is the possible scores need to be um, applied so that, for example, um, if have a quality of development and overall aesthetic beyond that, which is minimally required by the zoning ordinance, if that's you know, minimally important to us, um, that might be a possible 10 points. Whereas create an incremental tax value equal to or greater than $2 million, which I think we said in the past that you know we might want to discuss that amount on once it gets to council might be you know a, a potential point criteria of 20. So I think one of the things that we're missing um, is to um, uh, to apply the points and the, the point the, the possible score should reflect the uh, how important we feel the value is. And then an individual counselor would rate how they feel the project meets that. So for example, um, you know, if, if it's, uh, if we have a, a, you know, if it's, let's take the energy star. If we say that's a, a possible five points and the, um, the, the development is very strong on energy efficiency, meeting new certifications and, and everything else, then I might give that a five out of a possible five points. Um, if, if, if it's not really a consideration, I might give that, um, you know, or but they did a little, I might give that a one. So the, the policy needs to go forward with um, the, what the possible scores are, which is what is missing in this right now. Um, and then individual counselors as we do that um, and so what this would do uh, would be when we get to step four and each individual counselor has rated it, there would be an overall score. Um, here are the potential points and here is how this um, particular CEA request scored in each one of these areas. And here is how it scored overall. So let's say the potential points is 320 and this this application scored, um, you know, uh, 50. So we could set a threshold in the policy itself, or we could just use that as a tool as a council when we're looking at it. So I would say if something got a 50 out of a 320, it's probably not going to have a very good chance at um, getting a CEA. And whether or not the um, categories are correct yet. Um, I don't know, you know, you might want to start with it and modify it over time. Um, but there's definitely something missing in step four to refer to it, um, step four, four, uh, to refer to um, completing the scores and then that the scoring would be a criteria along with um, the other things that would be presented to council. Does that make sense? Um, it does. I just had a couple of observations if I could. Um, I don't doubt that the current composition of council would be interested in have the capability, I think, of, of doing what you su suggest. But I think thinking that a future council, you know, seven council members would have the interest and take the time to, to actually go through the scoring, I, with all due respect, I think it's probably too much to expect. So I understand your point. I, I wonder if there's not a um, kind of a, a, a different way of getting to the same point um so sort of having individual counselors all tasked with that because uh, we'll be chasing yes. cats yeah, i mean that's that's a fair point what the um you know maybe you could say just the finance committee would do it um and then that score from the finance yep. committee would be sent over to council um the idea is that um if you look throughout the entire policy and some folks who have read it have 
brought this point forward. You know, it's it's very it's very um, subjective, and um, it is going to be subjective by nature. So um, if you're able to, you can take subjective points. Um, and you can assign scores to them, and then you can objectively look at, a, at some subjective data qu quantitatively. So it's a way to take subjective data um, and give it some type of a quantitative score. But you know, if, if all seven counselors you know, wouldn't, wouldn't do it, I suppose the finance committee, um, who would be, uh, although it's not, it's not, it doesn't really, um, the reason it says for the whole council is because um, there's, there's no real step in here that the details would, that, um, that it, you know, maybe there is, but I'm not sure. I mean, it seems like it goes to a workshop pretty quickly. So I think the entire council gets involved pretty quickly. Yeah, with all due respect, respect I'm just suggesting my past experience, it's exceedingly <laughs> difficult sometimes just to get everyone to, to do things. And some of these may be very time sensitive. So I, I think your suggestion of finance committee is a very good one. Um, more times than not, those folks will be inclined and interested in these sorts of things, and, and plus there's only three as opposed to seven. I might also suggest rather than each individual uh, of the group, um, one other way to do it is that the group collaborates and comes up with a composite score. And the value of that is it forces discussion and it uh, hopefully shakes out subjectivity. There could be a counselor who um, scores something very poorly for some reason and unfairly brings down the overall score. Whereas if you subject it to a group process, some of that, uh, those outliers and anomalies get kind of scrubbed out uh, through the group discussion and your opinions can be changed. So just a, a thought, I think that's a way to uh, guard against any, uh, any weighting that wouldn't be fair to an applicant. Um, I guess the other the other point I would say on the threshold two two points um, you could have a threshold that you task staff with and I would say it'd be a fairly low bar if something is a real turkey so to your point if it's a 320 total points you know if it doesn't score a 200 it doesn't get past step two so it doesn't waste anyone else's time uh, there could be that kind of initial threshold inserted. Um, and applicants will want to do their own pre-scoring. You know what I mean? If they're smart, they'll look to see how they'll, they'll score. So I think it's, it's important to tell, this is an important process, but the real value of it is predictability to the extent that we can introduce that is to say, here's what we value. And you'll do that by virtue of how you award points, possible points. And to give people the, the, uh, uh, a known target, um, for them to work toward. And we have, can maybe, can you speak at all? This is really a little bit of a non sequitur, so I apologize if it's not really relevant, but we have a, we have a scoring point for the affordable housing ap application, correct? We do, but the notion there, these, these scoring met, uh, approaches work best when there's multiple applications and you're comparing one against another. So in this case, we're presumably not gonna have multiple ones at the same time, we could, but we'd be comparing against a benchmark and that benchmark presumably will reflect your values, what you think is important. So I just, I just want to be mindful that we use my, my it. My question was more, did we have a, um, so were you involved in helping create those values and those in that point system, I guess was my. Yes, I was the, okay. kind of the chief architect of it, yep. Okay, right, so I didn't know if you could compare these points with some of those to say, are we missing anything or you know, would, is some, would some of it not be, you know, worth including or, you know, so I don't know how, I don't know how carefully you've had a chance to look, look at the list and give an opinion on the list. Um, Incidentally, where, where did it come from? Were you able to, was it from another policy? Yeah, it was from another policy. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it's fairly comprehensive. The one thing I didn't see in here, um, and it may not be, I think it should be in the policy, but maybe not in the, this matrix is, this um, cost to serve analysis, ROI analysis, which has become a norm. Um, by my reading of this draft, I don't see any mention of that being a requirement uh, of this. Yeah, and Tom, that was one of my 
one of my comments that, that, that I think that's important to weave in to the into it somewhere, however we do that. John, I know you had your hand up, I think. Yeah, I just, uh, well, I, I had some comments and I, I liked actually what Tom was saying there about maybe instead of having this be, a, 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 you know, individual counselors fill out um, a scorecard, having a discussion maybe in a workshop or something to, to go over the value of a project or something after it gets to, gets to a certain point. But what we're, I've been struggling with this and probably why it's taken so long to get it to this point is that you can't really bind future councils to do what you want them to do today. So by definition, a CA and a TIF needs town council approval. How it gets there doesn't matter. If a council wants to put it on the agenda, um, they can do that and bypass this policy altogether. So I, it just seemed like there was a, if this was something we were delegating to the planning board to shepherd through to the process and then you know get it ready for final council approval, I think it, it could make sense to me, but right now it doesn't it's like we're i don't understand the point i feel i feel like maybe some guiding principles or something for things counselors should should consider when evaluating a, a tiff or cea um, like the cost benefit analysis is probably like 10 of them or something like that that might actually have more value than a 52 page policy that there's that nobody really has to follow uh, that, that's just kind of what my well, with the exception, John, you know, look at uh, the new numbered section four. It's the application process. I mean, staff yeah. certainly has to follow as applicants yeah. would have to follow council policy. You know, I think there's value in regularizing that. We don't really have, uh, we don't have a defined policy as to how we receive these and how we move them through. Yeah. So predictability is important for everyone involved. So I think there's great value in that regard. Your, but your point's well taken the final award and decision on whether one's granted is solely within the, uh, the council at the time. Right. But I would, I would say, you know, when past councils have, have put policies in place as a, a current counselor, you know, we, we definitely, we definitely follow them. Um, and in, if there's issues, you know, we maybe visit them and change them, but I'm not, I'm not sure we're trying to bind past councils as set forward a, a methodology to use that they would certainly be able to modify, you know, um, and I would think since it's new, would end up getting modified by future councils, you know, when, um, you know, issues or whatever come out about it. Um, certainly anything you start with uh, would not, you know, would, would probably end up with some modifying. I did have, um, I had a couple of small things, but I, I did have one other thing I had talked to Larissa about, um, and I think it's, I think it's just, um, so, you know, Tom, so I had picked up on, on your point, you know, right away in the beginning. I mean, I think this should, you know, very clearly say, so initiating or considering applications for economic development, tax increment financing, because I think we want to make it, at least I think it should be clear this is in the realm of the economic development, um, because we mentioned the, e, the, the ECD, et cetera, et cetera, and that, that's the pathway that all that would go. And so I only I only bring that up because um, I had talked to Larissa about the um, the applications, and so I'm I'm, I'm struggling with the um, the verbiage a little bit here, and and um, hopefully Tom, you can help me through this because the town is the one who applies for a TIF, right? So um, and then uh, you know then the applicant we don't have to go back to the state for a CEA, you know, so the TIF application we have in here is appendix two is, is a whole lot of things that we would have to tell the state, correct? If we, if we wanted to, to do that. Yeah. I wondered why appendix one was in here. Um, actually it's appendix two, I guess is the, the one I wondered about though you, we may wish to have an applicant if, if it's, if they're the one driving the creation of a TIF in the first place to really task them with, performing some of this work on our, you know, advanced work. Right. Um, and we get, you know, we, we, then we get to appendix three and then we say tip slash CEA. So, I mean, just the way I draw it in my mind is if, if we were to create another tip somewhere, um, you know, so somebody might come to it. So let's put affordable tips totally aside because I, I do feel like that's a separate policy, but, um, you know, you know, somebody might say, well, you know, this is a good, but I think that would almost originate with you and staff and, you know, um, maybe because somebody came to you with an idea and then we would work the TIF 
from there and then the applications are you know from the ceas that people might or might not want to apply for in an existing in an existing tip so i don't know I, i'm just struggling with that a little bit to see you know i think the, the questions are very interesting in the tip you know to that would be interesting to counsel to see you know hey what, what's this going to do job creation goals you know what what are they going to actually bring forward so I think some of the questions are kind of good, but I'm, I'm not so sure that it shouldn't be all kind of melded down into one application that covers, you know, the, the type of information the council would want to, would want to consider. That's, that's kind of where I'm at. And then we have the, uh, you know, um, like I say, the town council quote unquote scoring sheet is listed again. We probably don't need it both in the policy and an appendix. We could just refer to the appendix. But I, I'm fine with leaving the applications one way we are. I mean, we need to, we need to move forward and that could always be amended. I, I just kind of struggled with it just a little bit myself, but you know, I'm happy enough to leave it, leave it the way it is um, so that we can move this forward. But that that's kind of where I sort of, uh, you know, struggle just a little bit with the difference because I think most of the applications, you know, we have a pretty large tip um, in town already. So I think most of the applications we're going to see going forward are either affordable housing tips with a CEA or a CEA within our existing tip. I would agree with you. So, so I think I'm hearing a couple different things. One, John, I, I hear you about whether, you know, it makes any sense whatsoever. Um, I guess where I sort of my thoughts are, I think we were kind of, this has been around for two years. I think it probably makes sense to try to bring something back to the full council. I think your point's a great point, but I think there's an expectation that something will be sort of come out of finance anyway. Um, but I think it's a great point. I think we should have that conversation. I think Tom makes some good points about the importance Betsy, I wasn't quite sure when you were talking about the possible score, whether you were thinking on some of these things you wanted to have each one of these items having a different range of scores or whether it's just a simple one through 10. So I, I don't know if just for clarity. Right. So I would say, you know, if we could take a moment to go through um, or we could each do it, I, you know, I was hoping to get it finished, but it may be um, you know, and maybe I could have sent you an example. I'm, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, uh, it certainly may be that um, th they, they don't all meet um, an equal priority, you know, for, so, so, and I don't want to pick on, I don't want to pick on energy efficiency, but maybe energy efficiency is not as valuable to us as incremental tax value. So Peter, as I understand, and, and I would agree, this column says possible score. What Bessie's suggesting, and again, again, I agree, is that we should indicate what, by way of preference, assign a point value to the item. And then there should, frankly, be another column that is basically the applicant score. So you go through an application and you're comparing it against the stated criteria, assigning it a score, uh, and you total it up at the bottom. Yeah, and I would think I, what I had envisioned was the applicant would score themselves and even give us a reason. Well, okay, I just gave myself a 10 out of 10 points on this particular category, and here's why. You know, because we're going to do this, we're going to do that. I mean, it would be up to the applicant if they wanted to do that, but they would be able to say on their self-scoring, and then we would judge that, you know, okay, well, this is what they're saying, and I agree, or no, I don't think it's really quite that value. So the there really would be kind of three points possible score the applicant scoring themselves and then the council this council score you know what what the council gives it if we're, if we're not going to do a council if we're going to do a finance committee score of how the finance committee uh, rated it and then um, the bottom line of the possible score never changes because it's you know it's, it's the maximum of all the points you could receive the applicant scoring himself that would change depending on the um, application and then the um, you know and I'm, I you know I think to get started I think Tom's suggestion is is fine you know that we would go take this we include it in the policy this goes to finance and finance 
um, in committee goes through and um, discusses each one and gives it a composite score. I think personally, I think that would work. I think that would work well. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't, somebody could change it in the future. And then that score would be different for each project. Does that make any more sense now? <laughs> or yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. I think it, I mean, if we're going to score each one of these a possible range based on priorities, that adds some complexity just to, you know, I was thinking we would be able to do something with this tonight to kind of get it out of committee and on. That's going to, I mean, so that means the three of us, I guess, would, or, or a staff, um, could come up with possible scores for each one of these. I just think that's that's a lengthy conversation for us probably as a group. Um, right. Well, what about, um, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, you know, what if we set a range for, uh, for the overall scoring, the criteria to be assessed? So the range I mean, I, possible score would be somewhere between 10 and 50. And then, um, you know, let um, let staff take a swing at it, um, and then uh, you know we could just uh, discuss it at council. And you know, if someone had a real issue with what got chosen, they could address it ahead of time and say, "Hey, I really, I think that's too, you know, I think that's too high." You know the. Everything in my experience suggests that that is to be avoided if you can. Um, it's just exceedingly difficult, even with three of you to to, to draft, much less uh, seven. So uh, as much of this work can be done at committee and come forward by way of a you know complete recommendation, I would recommend that just for ease of process. Um, so. <laughs> One one thought building up what Betsy said. I mean, we could just keep it simple and just say possible score score on a range of zero to ten. Um, but that would give everything. Then each person scoring in this case, I do like the suggestion. Maybe the original policy has it go through finance. Um, it's either that or I guess what's the will of the committee, Betsy John? Do you want to? put this on the agenda for the next finance committee meeting and try to work through the possible scores based on priority. Any, any sort of preference? It's just this thing's just lived on forever. So it's right. The staff is willing to take a swing at uh, putting together possible scores. It's going to reflect, I guess, our priorities and we're certainly open to get your input, but we, we can take an, an attempt at that. So you aren't starting from scratch. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I support that. And it's really points available, right? Or, or you know, point value. Not. In, so this is how much you know item one could get you, and then next to it would be uh, the actual applicant score. Okay. Yeah, and I think the introduction of this approach is good in that it makes something that could be considered subjective more objective. But I, I and if that's our goal, it's the it's the right goal. We need to make sure that we prepare it in such a way that it's, it's as objective as possible. Uh, and I am pleased to hear that you're willing to have the finance committee do the scoring. And I really do think having a kind of composite score from you as a committee or the future committee is a way to kind of wash out um, any outliers, if you will. It kind of forces you to put your heads together and disagreements, whatever it takes and come up with a composite score. Um, and because they're, you know, in normal circumstance, if you've got multiple applications, you could do a range up to 10 points and then the highest point, you know, wins, so to speak. But yeah. this, this is an application you're comparing against a static benchmark. So, so Peter, I mean, this is August 13th. Um, and if we had a goal to get this to council by September 16th, I wonder if we could, and not that, not that the chair and the co-chair would um, approve that, but if, if, if we had that goal, um, you know, could we work backwards and, you know, maybe come together for, um, you know, one more meeting just yep. to finish this off yep. and then get it to council by September 16th 
Um, obviously, it, it would be great if we were doing it, you know, more like around the, the second week of September, so everyone would have quite a bit of time to read it on council. Um, is that? Do you feel that's workable? I mean, I I think we're closer than it seems like, especially if staff takes it. You know, I think mm -hmm. we have a pretty. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think we have a pretty common set of values across the town um, that, you know, we may have a few differences, but I think a lot of values we have are the same. And then the ones that aren't, we could debate those. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to, since Tom Sutter volunteered his team, I think it depends on, you know, what. Yeah, I, I think we can turn that around. If it's, it's really uh, fleshing yeah. out the scoring matrix, I think we can do that. If you're willing, I do have three or four questions I just want to check in on and we maybe I think we can move quickly through them because I'd like to bring to you as complete a draft next time you meet. Yeah. So Liam, if you go back to page uh, three. It's in section two. No, I'm sorry. It's under credit enhancement agreement right there. I just want to check in uh, terms. Uh, agreement shall extend between one and 20 years. Law, the statute allows you to go to 30. I just wanted to confirm with this group that you didn't, you wanted to limit your flexibility in that regard. Well, I don't remember, I don't remember that conversation. Do you, is anybody? I'm pretty sure that I was. I don't know why you would. No, I don't remember that. I don't, it doesn't seem like it makes sense to limit it to 20, although I could, you know, I could see someone making an argument, but, but, but I don't remember the specific conversation, no. Well, yeah, I, I think having the range, Tom, one to 30, then, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. in the I next thought, remember that thought, the next thought says up to 100, so you're, you're recognizing that, you know, uh, so that struck me that it should probably be 30 yeah. just to allow yourselves the maximum flexibility. You can do yeah, something. Everybody about. agree just by nodding, everybody agree? Yep. Hey, Tom. Yes. Do you mind if we back up since we're on that page? I had one for that page, right? A bullet right before credit enhancement agreement. Um, just to add, the town by vote of council majority may modify the portion of tax revenue to be retained in the um, designated development district. So it, that is the way they work, but I thought it would be good to actually spell that out that if a council can vote to change that. So that's just an additional bullet in that tip yeah, district discussion? Yeah, above credit enhancement. Would you mind sending me that language? Oh, yeah, no, I definitely will. Okay. Yeah, I, that makes sense. You're, this whole section is just a recitation of what the TIF statute allows. So I think that's right. Exactly. That's right. Um, I, actually, while we're doing that, can you go to, Liam, go to page one, section two, tax rules and conditions. Those, it, it, we're saying it has to meet um, criteria, at least three of the following objectives. Tom, is that boilerplate language or is that unique? I mean, is that, can that be, what I'm trying to address is what you brought up nowhere in this document that we talk about, there has to be a financial analysis done to make yep. sure that it's, it, it makes ec economic sense for the town. No, these are, uh, to my knowledge, these are not derived from the state uh, statute. I, I believe these are local preference objectives. So my request would be wherever, as you guys do the edits, and if others agree, wherever it fits to build on your observation, I think we need to have a criteria in there that, that it has to make economic sense for the town from a financial point of view as well. So is that your cost? Is that the cost? Is that where you want to put the, the part about the cost analysis? Yes. Yeah. Or somewhere in the document so that that becomes part of the evaluation. I don't know if it fits better in the criteria, um, but in order to show that it makes economic sense for the town financially, then you've got to do that cost analysis. So, I mean, you know, yeah, I'll look at it. Now, I think you're right. It probably is best stated right at the front end of the document. Hit you, yeah, hit, hit you right away. And and the way you worded that gives a fair degree of latitude. 
you know, economic sense or financial sense may mean one thing to this council and mean something yeah. else to another, but it, but it preserves the thought that this is an important checkpoint that needs to be met an objective. John and Betsy, you guys okay with that? Yep. I am. I'm not sure where the right place to put it in is, but yeah, I think you can add it. Okay. Somewhere. So the ex expectations at least like that. Okay. Peter, do you see that continuing on to the, to the scoring sheet as well? Because I mean, I think that that on some level that analysis will be again, somewhat subjective to the counselor, correct? I mean, what the actual ROI amounts to and how significant that is. Um, yeah, my thought was, you know, maybe it's up front here as one of the conditions, and then maybe it does work its way on to the scoring sheet. But I know Betsy and Larissa had worked a lot on that scoring sheet, so I don't know how John and Betsy feel, but that was sort of a thought. No, I, I'm totally open to the scoring sheet to be changed. I don't feel like it got much of a vetting because, you know, as we did, and then the world blew up, and then, you know, so um, it was an initial pass but yeah any suggestions improvements changes to the scoring sheet i'm i'm totally open to i mean it should reflect you know what the council wants to look at and that seems very important to capture that so i'm okay with with staff as they come back and noodle this and see where it fits best come back with a recommendation and we can look at that okay yeah, I would even be okay with, you know, like a step, a checkpoint in this process somewhere is, is for you know, to supply a standard cost benefit analysis or ROI or something along those lines. Okay, great. I don't know if that answered your question, Liam. We probably confused you more than No, that. no, it, it did. I mean, it seems like that's, you know, that seems to be a common theme of council discussions over the last uh, 12 to 18 months as these things have come forward is what's what's the impact, what's the cost? And so yeah. uh, to the degree that's going to continue to be a major major theme and, uh, and highlight, then I think that there's probably a few opportunities to incorporate that into the understanding. Okay. Well, I, I think really quickly on that, the number five, create the incremental tax value, um, maybe incorporate it into that. I think that was one Larissa had taken out of the document um, that was already in and kind of put, put that in. Um, it might be, you know, working that one, um, you know, it's it's incremental in relation to, you know, cost to serve or, or something like that. You're right, it's objective in the end, right? Because someone might say, look, you know, you know, a million dollars of incremental value with a cost to serve of 500 is, is something we ought to do. And someone else might say, no, it's nothing we should do. So, um, you know, it does end up being objective, but um, I think it's a little bit captured in number five on the scoring sheet, uh, but it's not totally captured because to me, the way this one is worded number five, is it's, it's not very um you know it's not relative to anything you know sure. right yeah it doesn't it, it tells you what the right yeah it tells you what it's going to bring in it doesn't tell you what it's going to cost right right exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, another question I had uh, it's at the end of section two just above the assessment criteria uh, going up the third bullet at the top here developers will present council with an annual report on progress i i'm mindful of this only because i am working with uh, the downs to do their progress report next week <laughs> and theirs is very detailed um, and we have responsibilities as well so my simple question is you know what's included what's the expectation uh and there may be some where you don't need it so i, I i'm just pointing out that that might be a difficult one to satisfy without stating what the expectations are on in terms of what to report on. Tom, kind of along those lines, in Portland, they have an economic development committee or something that provides a report about all of the TIFs and CEAs uh, to the council once a year. That I think has value and probably is sufficient, but to do that, they probably need some, some way to get information from the individual applicant. Um, that's well, the, di amazing. the difference there would be task staff with doing an annual report as opposed to the individual right. developers. Right. And we could work with council to figure out what, you know, what's of interest in that regard. 
Yeah, that, that that's a very helpful report. It's pretty detailed and it does go to even to by TIF and it summarizes it. I don't know, can, does um, Councilor Hamill, since you were very involved in this in the past, um, do you have a comment on this or not to put you on the spot, but. I stepped away for just a minute. So if you could repeat the question, that would be helpful. Yeah, you're entitled to do that. You're not on the committee. So. Sorry, sorry. I snuck away from yeah. a brief moment, but what's the question? I'll let Tom. Uh, repeat. Yeah, the third bullet here, Don, if you can see the screen, it says developers will present council with an end report on progress. I was just observing the point that unless we uh, state our expectations, it's going to be challenging to get that done uh, in a format that's satisfactory. Yeah, Tom, I, I'd rather have that turn on the, the, the negotiating of the CEA, you know, rather than put it in here as a policy statement, but could you scroll back just a minute, uh, just one more page? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I look, at, look at the one, not, maybe not all CEAs are created equal, so certainly the downs, I, I think it made all kinds of sense for us to put that in there and to be pretty specific about it and to define processes, that sort of thing. You know, do we really, little dolphin, we're, Right. Expecting them to come back every year and update us. I don't know, you know, or, or Bessie, Bessie too, you know, I don't, yeah, or, yeah. I know they have regular choices, but I don't feel the need necessarily for, for all CEAs to do that. You're making, you're making my point much better than I did. Uh, oh. <laughs> you're right. I think you'll know when you want that and to negotiate the terms in the CEA where you, ex you are explicit as to what the report will contain and its frequency. I think that's a better place for it. And it's enforceable, frankly, in that yeah. document. Okay. So, so, I mean, I guess that gets back to one key question that you asked, Tom, is, you know, is this going to apply to affordable housing, CEA slash TIF? So I do think those are a little bit different, but you could, if we stuck with economic development ones, I'm not sure you would need that from WEX, right? Because the WEX one was to entice them to come to Scarborough. It's a basically, a, you know, a reduction that gets passed on, you know, to that, that low their cost of being in that space. Um, so what's the performance criteria there, you know? That, that, that's yeah. my point, precisely, yeah. I, so, I think if I could step in, I know that we had asked for something like that on an annual report, mostly because some of these credit enhancement agreements said we're going to have, we're going to hire X number of people or we're going to do this or we're going to do that, and there was no way for us to actually ensure that they were actually doing those things. So I think that's one of the reasons why that was put in, but. Oh, uh, yeah, well, you're right, we could we could do that because, you know, if numbers of people don't materialize, then that maybe the housing thing isn't going the way we want. And, um, but um, I think we, you know, we have in there credit enhancement agreements may contain provisions for the suspension or termination of benefits to the applicant as provided for in the agreement. Um, does that, does that kind of get to, that you're going to be looking at criteria like that, that you would have to have some kind of reporting that you would include in the um, in the negotiation. Well, I, I think Don's point is is excellent, which is uh, and maybe the thing to do is to strike this general statement and requirement, if you will, for all to be treated equally, and for those that it's necessary and appropriate, uh, it be contained within the CEA. So maybe it's a simple, different phrasing uh, to the extent that the town is interested in frequent reporting from the developer. Um, such expectations will be negotiated as part of the credit enhancement agreement. I'm okay with that. I like that. Betsy? Yeah, I like that. I wish I could remember what I said. <laughs> I'll yeah, listen to it's on tape. I'll listen to the tape. All right, moving on. Uh, John, are you okay with that? Did I see you nod? Okay, great. So number three. Yeah, my, I, I, am I still have the floor here? Sure. Okay, just trying to move through for you. In uh, section four, Liam, it's just above appendix one. Keep going. Yeah, right there, top of that page. So that first bullet, it talks, uh, this is the retainer. And I'm not questioning the retainer. There was a lot of conversation, yeah. so let's move yeah. past that. 
but it, it's to be used to reimburse for staff time. And I'm just flagging, I'm not sure how we will be tracking that. Um, let, I'll eat those words. We'll figure a way to do it. So let's, uh, we spent more time than we should have on this already. So, uh, All right. And then if you allow us just to have a little bit of editorial license on the appendices, I think we talked about it earlier. I think there's some redundancy here. So um, okay. let us take a look at it and come back to you. I, I think we understand what you want to accomplish, but I think we can do it a little simpler. Can, can I ask just one additional question um, on the criteria list? Uh, so go to number three. Again. And I was just curious, and we may already have this address, but the first bullet, um, documentation of employment or financial projection must be provided. Do we want to change or to and? I mean, do we want both? I mean, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious why it's one or the other. Yeah, I would, I would say change it. It appears, it appears in a couple different places. So. I might suggest, you know, four is the employment one. If you scroll down, Liam, just one more. So you're very explicit on the employment piece. So maybe you just limit the first one to documentation of financial projections must be provided because you really cover it pretty heavily in four. So do what? So what was your you huh? Drop the reference to employment in number one and rely on number four to supply that information. Okay. And Peter, I just had a, a couple more in section four, um, which I can email, but this one was just kind of the housekeeping. Um, you know, I think we mentioned this briefly, Tom, you know, that this is an application um, process for credit enhancement um, within an economic development TIF, you know, so, I so we don't have to spell it out everywhere, but you know, it just might make sense to make sure we're, we're all talking economic development to, um, and then Peter, I had another question um, that I wondered what you and John thought, uh, and it had to do with between step three and step four. Um, so I think now there's a new step in there that we're saying that the finance committee will do a composite score on the scoring sheet. Is that what I understood? Yes, I think that's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. And then there had been some questions. So, you know, at step two, um, we had talked about, um, you know, you know, a lot of work has been done at that point um, that maybe the town council would be notified um, you know, via executive session if necessary, you know, that an application, you know, has been received. Um, no other work would happen at that point other than town council would be notified. Um, it wouldn't have to be executive session if, if we said the town council wouldn't receive any information that it would just be, we, we would just know that the town had been working with folks and there was, there was one coming on the docket. Or if we wanted the town council to have more information you know, in all likelihood, it would need to come through executive session because, you know, you're not really in negotiations yet. But there was a, a point that we discussed of, you know, kind of a notification because I think there could be a long time between step three and then the finance committee and then by the time we get to a workshop or something like that. And I think the thought was, you know, there's, you know, it would be good for the council to be notified a little earlier sometimes in these process, even without details. So I'm just bringing that back up. That had been a past discussion. So you're suggesting is there something we can build into this language that gives that heads up? Yeah, and step two, the town manager shall have the final authority to invite application. The town council shall be notified via executive session if necessary that an application has, uh, we can't read my own writing, but I can finish that word off if we're interested in doing that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm okay adding that sort of step. John, what about? Yeah, I remember, uh, Peter, we had a quite a bit, and Tom, you probably recall this as well. We had a lot of discussion uh, about this um, 
Uh, you know, where is there an opportunity for, for uh, you know, an early flag, you know, for the council to know this is coming? And I know we went back and forth on it quite a bit, and it, it, it appears here uh, when the actual uh, application is completed. And I think you, I recall you making very good points that well, it's a lot of the staff work, it's not really, it's not really real until it, you know, uh, it, it comes, the application's approved. So, uh, I mean, we also talked about, uh, you know, the, the council, or at least the finance committee would get an early read of this because of their participation in the scoring. That's so I don't know, I, otherwise I don't know that there's a specific point other than, you know, when the chair, when the chair gets the request to schedule a workshop and we're on the, you know, we're on the takeoff roll. So. I think where it gets real is right at the end of step two. Yeah. The sentence says the town manager shall have final authority to invite an application. I think when that invitation occurs, there's a mutual obligation to advise the council of that. That's where I had put it at the end of that. So, okay. So Great. John, would you, would you be okay adding some language that just codified that? Yes. And, and I, Honestly, I'm not crystal clear on where the right checkpoint for finance committee is, whether it's before or after the workshop. It's probably before, but I, I, I agree. Yeah, um, it, yeah I mean, it could be. I had it after. I had it after five, but um, yeah. So there you go. Anyways, I'd, I'd be open to somebody's thoughts or um, suggestions on that. I had it before because I had. Um, had an, an an edit in four that the council would consider the composite scoring sheet. I wasn't calling it that before that, but the council would consider the, the scores apl applied from the applicant and from the um, finance committee as one of the factors. I guess what I'm thinking though is for the workshop, this is just, we're learning about the project. Oh, that's a good and point. And if there's no yeah. appetite at all, yeah. Don't even send it to finance, just, you know, it can die there. If there is, hey, finance, take yeah. a closer look at this. No, you're right. We learn a lot more in that. So I, I think you're right. It does go after. Okay. I think you guys are right. So Tom, is that clear as mud? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, I think we can work it into six because okay. six in the end talks about finance committee um, making a recommendation to council. It seems to me that recommendation should be based among a number of things, including uh, scoring. Yeah. And, then, and then I just had one other quick kind of like little housekeeping on the um, uh, under application fee. Um, just a little bit of the verbiage is not great. You know, it says and any other direct expenses like required legal fees. So I just think it's a little cleaner to say and any other direct expenses such as legal fees or con consulting fees. I think um, like required is not is not super concise language. So. I would encourage, you know, Tom and uh, Liam as they look at it, if they find any language that's not really con concise, I'm, I'm all for cleaning it up. So just to, to make that point. And that's it. That's all I had. All right. So, yep. Okay. Staff, okay. Staff's got some, some lots of work. Um, Tom, maybe let us know when it's reasonable for it to kind of circle back through. I think Betsy made a good suggestion. If it's possible to do it before September, that'd be good. But if it's not, we, you know, just let us know. Be before September? Well, before before that okay. town council meeting. So we, we could eat, meet maybe sometime early September as a finance committee to kind of look at it and get it out of committee, but that's- Can, can you agree now that it would be single item so we could, you could be solely focused on this with the hope of- Sure. Getting through it? Yeah. With the hope of getting through it. Sure. Okay. I'll work directly with you, Peter, when uh, when I consult with staff, okay? I'll just okay. I'll just make one more quick comment that may or may not help, Tom. Um, you know, with all these appendixes, and then it goes into appendix three, and then there's more cri you know, criteria to be, you know, so I think the, the, the goal was to, um, you know, have... You know, appendix three is so that they would explain, but to focus on the scoring sheet, make sure we have everything in the scoring sheet that you want. And then they're not trying to answer questions outside this, the scoring sheet, although there may be some that are applicable. Um, but as you can see, this tracks with the scoring sheet. So if we're tracking with the scoring sheet, that kind of ties the whole thing together. That was, that was the intent anyway. Which I hope means we can take some stuff out, I guess, is the long and the short of it. Yeah. Okay. That's my intent. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, in, in respect of time and where we are, there's three agenda items left, um, maybe four agenda items left actually. Does anybody have a preference? I mean, I think some can be pretty quick. A uh, suggestion might be the financial analysis of the proposed CEA. We've got sheets in front of us. They're pretty self-explanatory. We probably assume we're going to be reviewing these at our next, at, at the first read or whatever. Um, does anybody want to spend any time on these sheets that are in front of us? Are there any questions or have, have we reviewed them and we're fine kind of moving on? I, I was fine as presented. I, I don't know if Tom wants to go over them. Um, the, the, the one thing that would be helpful, um, and I'm pleased to talk about all of it, but can, yes, these scenarios, uh, these directly came out of the last workshop. So that should be familiar to you. The first scenario was what we've been working with right along. Uh, scenarios two and three were two variations that we were directed to run. Um, I, you know, I've had some conversation with, uh, with Don and Paul about this. Uh, from our perspective, and, and the developers is, has expressed their interest, I guess, in scenario three, which is the 75 at 20 years. And so um, we have proceeded maybe at some per peril, but we've proceeded with preparing the draft CEA based on this, this approach. Um, from my perspective, it's obviously far superior to the town. It saves about a million bucks over term. Uh, and it uh, enables the developer to uh, get the full three points, which they've stated is a, a real key objective of theirs. So this seems to be the, uh, the winner, so to speak. And I guess it'd be helpful just to use this group to, to confirm that that's the case. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, it makes sense. I think I think the only thing I had meant or one of the questions I asked is, you know, is there something we can learn from this process? It, what's become clear to me is these, these processes seem, these deals are really complex and the developers bringing stuff to us are, are really subject matter experts. But, you know, I, I guess it just begs the question if both of these have the same points, but the same, it saved taxpayers a million dollars, that should have been the first venue we pursued. So I'm just wondering going forward whether it makes sense that we hire on our team some type of financial consultant that is really familiar with these things and kind of can show us the ins and outs of how we get to where we want to go, but do it in a way that's the most efficient for taxpayers. And so I think it's just a question we should be asking ourselves to evaluate future deals. What do we need to to, to make sure we're maximizing what we get versus what it's cost, if that makes any sense. Well, just let me state the, the challenge that I face. Uh, you know, a developer has a right to make a request and, and they did. Um, it, it is often difficult to know whether I should insert myself to negotiate uh, beyond their request. And in this case, you know, clearly there were other options here, but what was being presented and what I had worked with them is what they had asked for. Yeah, but I think, so I think, but that where I struggle with it, I look at it as a town council member, it's my fiduciary responsibility to say, you know, we should be negotiating with them. Um, you know, and part of the process, what we heard in, in sort of the first sessions were the only option was what we were looking at. There was no other option that they weren't going to lose points and other became available. That's, but I'm just saying, you know, before we, when we get the developers deal, is there a mechanism? Is there a resource that we can use? I mean, certainly, you know, our attorney brought it up at the workshop. The attorney mm -hmm. brought it up somewhere else online that was helpful. So that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not right or wrong. It's just, there's a learning that these things are complex. There's lots of different ways to get to the end result. 
that can have, as in this case, pretty significant consequences to the taxpayers. So not trying to find fault. No, no, I know. No, no, it's a dilemma. I mean, Shauna was involved from the first discussion on this matter in lockstep with me. So, um, you know, that that suggestion came up only, I think, in response to reservation and concern that she heard being expressed by council members as a way to another way to approach this to maybe um, keep the deal alive. So well, it's yeah, timing really, is everything. And really quickly, I mean, and I've certainly I've you know heard a lot third hand. It was awesome talking to the different people involved and certainly the conversation I'm sure played out. But um, you know, I am still struggling why we didn't go through an affordable housing tip on this because you know we could be looking at 50 percent for 30 years and they would get the three points. So um, you know the um, uh, I still guess I don't quite understand how that happened. And I'm not sure we need a policy or or, or anything else in place, but um, I, my understanding was the developers originally came looking for an affordable housing tip because that's the way they uh, do business. And then you know, we had suggested, well, wait, we already have a tip. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm not questioning that. I'm just, just so looking to understand it because you know, from my standpoint, um, I think the, the value of the affordable housing tip is it, it gives us an opportunity as a town to really look at our values and our, our, you know, where we're at with affordable housing and, um, you know, have a larger conversation around um, what we're doing with affordable housing. And, you know, and I'll, you know, and I've already said it, but I just ended up really confused when this came through economic development tip because all I did was look at it on my own. I had not talked to anybody outside um, at that point. So, um, you know, I still am not quite clear why we did that. I guess, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I take Peter's point and put that in, but if we'd had some, you know, some level of expertise that said, no, it's, it's still better to carve out an affordable housing tip for them. And I'm not, I'm not making that judgment. I'm just saying that somebody might have said, you know, this, this is, these are reasons why you still may, uh, you know, carve out an affordable housing tip for them. Um, you know, I'm, ju I'm just, you know, like you say, it's complex. I'm not sure how we get there, but um, I do still, I am still struggling with that you know, to some extent. Yeah, I, I've accepted full responsibility. I'll continue to. I, I don't see that there's any advantage. In fact, I, I would argue there's an advantage to us that the outside limit was 28 years rather than 30 um, because of the existing TIF and you know, it already running its term. So uh, I'll accept full responsibility. Um, and, I, and really, I was thinking from a process point of view, rather than have, having to pull that parcel out of the existing TIF and put it in a new TIF, we have the mechanism in place to do what they're asking. Right. Yeah. It, it yeah. does make a difference to the taxpayer. You know, if we, if we give them seventy-five um, percent for for twenty um, for twenty years, you know, that that would be the same. But um, I think if we could give them. I don't know. I don't have the point in front of me. We could give them fifty percent at for twenty years under. You know, I, I don't know. Never mind. But it, it just. It's uh, oh. no, it's still it's it's still to Peter's point, it's complex. So, just a couple. Com I just want to make a couple comments about this. I think Peter and I, and I think Tom were here. Uh, I mean, everybody's got a different learning curve on these things, and I think each time we see a new CEA, new TIFs, we learn something. Uh, you know, so we've had, and they they're all different shapes and sizes. You know, down CEA was a big one. Then we had the Wex, you know, the Wex CEA that's still pending, and now. And then we had Bessie Commons in between those two, Bessie Commons two, and then we now have this little dolphin, Jocelyn Place. So they're all different. I, and I, you know, it's 2020, you know, hindsight could be 2020. I think we're working hard to try to tighten up the process. The main thing is we got to get at the right answer. I think we're trending the right way on this one. I think the policy will help us do this, you know, will help us do this. And, and you know, if we implement everything we've talked about with the policy, it should flag the sort of things we're talking about. So I, you know, I think these are all valid questions, but I think we, you know, need to, it's a balance. And I don't, I, we're going to constantly struggle with this. Is it the right balance or not? And we learn, have we learned soon enough? And I'm sure that some circles are going to say it's never, you know, never going to be happy with it being soon enough. And I know uh, some developers are going to say it never, you know, never moving fast enough for us. So I just, you know, we're going to be living in that yin and yang for a while. But I, I you know, I support the comments that were made about, you know, the financial analysis. And I think we're getting, you know, we're getting smart fast on this. So, but it's, uh, you know, it's a learning curve for everybody, I think. 
But Peter, yeah. do you feel it rises to the level of the putting it in the policy to hire an outside advisor? Um, I'm not sure. Why don't, why don't we table that question until when we circle back on the policy next time? Sounds good. John, do you have a... Sorry, John. Yeah, I mean, just some, some comments and suggestions, I guess. I, I, I like this document that's up on the screen right now. And uh, kind of to Betsy's point, I actually would have preferred to see this as a, an affordable housing district. Um, not so much for the point aspect, but there's different uh, uses that you can have for the funds, the town funds that are uh, collected for affordable housing. So it, it opens up some additional ability to increase our capture rate. And it, this is where the suggestion comes in. I, I think one thing that we miss a lot is we're not very strategic from the town's perspective in terms of how we approach managing our capture and our capture. And different TIFs and CEAs. I think if we added uh, the, you know, the benefit, like right now we're about 5% probably uh, based on county taxes, revenue sharing, and, and school funding. About 5% of our captured um, assessed value or, or implied taxes that will be collected on that uh, will be returned or saved by the town. I think it would be useful to add a column uh, for those, uh, you know, that state subsidy, and then also maybe a column for the cost to serve. And uh, it doesn't have to be all that detailed. And I, I think as we mature, when we're looking out 10, 15 years, we might get better, uh, uh, a better view into what the potential upside is to the town in terms of what we can save from the state um, subsidies uh, by entering and maximizing our capture rate at the right time. So that's, uh, I guess those are two suggestions that I, I like this document and maybe even work it back into the policy standard uh, analysis. Form. So I think with that discussion, we will table what Betsy suggested, I think, till our, our longer, our next conversation. But Tom's specific question was, is it okay to proceed with this document, which I think is a 75% at 20 years? Is that? That's right. On? And that was your question, right, Tom, is whether we're comfortable with proceeding under that assumption? Yes, we're on a timeline to bring this in first okay. reading uh, next Wednesday. So we need to know how to posture the, the draft CEA document. Yeah. So Betsy, John, are you comfortable with the 75 percent at 20 years? Yeah. I have no reason not to be, yeah. Right, out of these three options, um, with the with my understanding, what we're saying is this would be what we would consider for voting um, about. Yes. yes. So I think that's a yes, Tom. Okay, good, thank you, that's helpful. Um, Next item on the agenda, which, which hopefully I know we're creeping up here. Um, we, it, 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 this is another one like the CEA, Tom, this con yeah. conversation, as you have pointed out, has been around for a while. <laughs> I was shocked, Peter, when I looked back at the timeline and how much time passed in between the last time you talked about it. Uh, there's all yeah. sorts of good reasons why that happened. Right, absolutely. So I think, Tom, and maybe um, you gave us quite a bit of materials, including, I think, something Larissa had talked about, which, is, which was a very sophisticated model. But Liam, if you maybe could, could just spool ahead a little bit um, to some of the exhibits that Tom, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I, let me just speak to it quickly. Uh, you know, yeah. This was the presentation that uh, Larissa and, and Ruth and I brought forward back in October of 2018. And at that point, we were really at a crossroads. We didn't, we were talking about all sorts of things forward looking. And uh, this was intended, and it actually served a purpose after about an hour's discussion to focus attention. And yeah. if you're interested at all, have the time, there's about an hour of that meeting that um, captures all of that conversation. And I found it instructive and helped me remind uh, how that went. So if you, if you have the time and the interest, I encourage you to do it. Um, so the next one, Liam, if you scroll forward, is what we actually brought, brought forward based on the um, um, on the input from that October 18 meeting. So keep going, Liam. And we chose, keep going, we're right out of this presentation. Keep going. 
So here it is. So right, wrong, or indifferent, because it was a format that we had and that we were all somewhat familiar with, we tried to use and emulate the tax rate comp sheet um, display approach, if you will. And so the, uh, the, uh, the, the upshot is uh, trying to look at a three-year outlook. And uh, that's what this does. And honestly, I don't recall that we got much reaction to that. Uh, and that's what I might suggest that this committee, where you start, um, is to give us some feedback, whether confirm that this is the direction you want to go, and ideally give us feedback on the presentation and the display, how, how it could be most helpful to you. So this this um, this attempts and it does predict everything, including the final mill rate, uh, which is an area that we were kind of very cautious about. I think Peter would confirm that. Uh, but this uh, you know takes into account all of the school and educational revenues and expenses, capital costs, all of our other associated expenses, including TIF obligations and CE obligations, and uh, and even does some valuation estimates into the future, which is really kind of uncomfortable ground for us to be on. But that's really what's required to be in a position of predicting future tax rates. And, and, and a little bit of background, and Don, I think you were involved too. The genesis of this was really trying to get to sort of the point I think John has made several times is to become a little more strategic, right? You know, every year we get really pulled into the annual budget and it's sort of year by year. We haven't really done a good job to look out in time what happens to different things. And what we we're trying to develop this for was we know we have some pretty significant capital outlays coming. At that point in time, it was a community center, it was the public safety building, it was a school. Um, this was really an attempt to try to look at, geez, what do some of these decisions have and what is sort of the impact? And Tom, I remember you presenting this and it's not a perfect model by any means, mm -hmm. but I think we concluded that this is sort of a, a format we're used to seeing. Yep. Um, it seemed like it was something that it wasn't going to be a hurtling effort for staff to put together, but it was kind of a guidepost. And I think we were comfortable if this was okay. generally in, in the direction we wanted to go. Then what I'd ask, Liam, if you could scroll to the next screen, um, what this is, is uh, all the assumptions and kind of the discussion around what's baked into that. And so I would ask between now and your next meeting that you all take a moment to look at this and provide some reaction that, you know, have we made the right assumptions? If not, let's talk about how to tweak that. So with that, we can really start to create this consistently time over time. I think Don, Don has a question. Oh, I was just uh, going to make a comment. Um, you know, I, I like uh, going back to the the high level stuff that uh, that Larissa had presented. Also, the uh, you know the uh, the resource material that she presented in terms of how how towns approach this. You know, there, there's a four or five year plan that uh, can be undertaken that's a very ambitious effort. I like really what Tom has done here, which is to try to break it down, uh, build on some things that we've started, and you know, try to maybe, uh, you know, boil this down a little bit. So maybe it's a, you know, it's a three-year strategic plan where we're updating. Once we do it, we're updating just, you know, we're updating it just one more year every time we go through another another budget cycle. And, and we're relying on other things that, that are strategic in nature. You know, the comprehensive plan, we have other strategic inputs. We have a capital plan, a long-term capital plan. So I, I, I like this approach and I like kind of using what uh, we have in place and what's familiar and building on that. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, a, a great example, uh, we still don't know what the effect of the pandemic is gonna have on state right. revenues and therefore ours. So that is something that never could have been expected, wasn't factored into here. We'll need to modify our assumptions uh, as we know more in the coming months here. Can we scroll, John scroll back? Yeah, John. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I think your format is fine in terms of presenting it with as the mill rate calculation. I think that it makes sense. It's what we're used to looking at. One thing, I, you might reverse it, though. Right now, you're kind of working towards your mill rate, and I think that's actually what we managed here. That's uh, typically, we uh, manage to a 3% increase. So I, I might look at it as 
Well, if we do a 3% increase, what does that create for capacity in terms of different years? Do, can we fit a capital project in here without messing up, um, you know, having a predictable mill rate? Um, other than that, I thought it was fine. And I, I think to Peter's point, I think you want to encourage those discussions at, at two levels, the big ticket items that are coming down the pike. Um, when might you fit those in or, or slot them on your plan? And I think each council could kind of decide that you know, every year or however frequently we do this. And then you have the staff level priorities, you know, the smaller capital items as well um, that, you know, could I do, I think we're pretty good at the, those items today. And those could just flow into the model. Yeah. Well, I, and John, I would, I, I would add the third, the third bucket might be really helpful to model the impact of different labor negotiations. We're thinking about that, those contracts that are multi-years with escalators in them, it, you know, could be helpful to see what that takes away in capacity downstream. Right. Uh, yeah, Peter, I was thinking on the gross, on the municipal gross or, um, or any of maybe, maybe break those down just a little, um, you know, employee, employee expense, which would include, you know, salary wages, benefits, um, and other you know, things that are in the budget that doesn't include that. And then an interest expense um, that, you know, because the interest expense gets rolled into the municipal gross um, each year. And um, I think with those three big buckets, you've got the capital um, that you're, you're looking at projecting, um, but then you could model what you're seeing some of those salary expenses or yeah. you know, new positions, um, things like that. And then obviously the more we move forward, that interest expense, I think. Betsy, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if anyone else is having trouble, but I you're fading in and out for me. Oh, okay. Uh let me just say it again or maybe cut off video, cut off your video and see if the sound improves. Okay. Now I'll try out. And there is an audio and I can't explain that because there's nobody else in the house. Uh, no, that's not that's not helping either, huh? Um, yeah, it must be the Wi-Fi going in and out or something. No, that's just better. Yeah, we'll probably that, that recover. So, Tom, I, on this one, if you're looking for direction, I mean, I think this is generally. I mean, does this work? To try to put together is this is this yeah, doable? No, I it, it is doable. Uh, you know, I think we need to go back through and look at the assumptions and yeah. tune them up. And I encourage all of you to as well. Um, we don't have all the answers here. We have better information, so inevitably some things have changed here. I was just looking at the uh, mill rate calculations. Um, we did not account for any impact of reval because the actual. You know, tax rates uh, that 1615 ended up being 1470, and then the next one 1488. Um, so uh, clearly, things need to be tuned up here, yeah. and we can do that between now and the next time we meet. Yeah, that's great. And then the other question I have for you, Tom, we had we had originally um, talked. We had originally talked. Wow, I'm giving you feedback. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. I yes. I hear the feedback too. Um, we had originally talked about it being a, a three to five year projection. Did we talk about, is it just so complex to do five that it just isn't meaningful or is it? The final direction you gave um, at about Mark an hour and 20, I think, or an hour and 10 rather on the uh, October of 18 was to focus on three years. So that's yeah. what we did. All right. So Peter, can you hear me now? Is it any better? Yeah, a little better, yeah. So, yeah, what I was requesting was to have the municipal gross and the education gross broken um, into, instead of one line item, broken into three buckets, which yeah. would be employee expense, um, other, and interest expense. Yeah. Does that work, Tom? Is that doable or is that? It's more work. Um... You know, essentially, we're growing the gross by a certain percentage based on historical performance. Um, I suppose we can do that with some further level of detail. What 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 purpose does that serve? So I think what what Peter was mentioning, like if you're going to model out, um, you know, uh, 
a negotiate a labor negotiation a salary increase or something like that i mean it just would help to have the line broken out so you could see if the gross is going up by you know 10 percent is it is it because of an employee expense is it because of an interest expense what what's driving that gross what's driving the increase in the gross you know, we certainly do that obviously on an annual basis with great clarity and granularity i i think it gets watered down considerably and i'm not sure what purpose it serves looking out too far in the future but um we can take a look at it so like in this example you know from 2020 to 2021 you know there's a little under a two million dollar increase in the gross so if this were an, an estimate I mean, if this were a projection, I suppose it seems to me we'd spend a fair amount of time asking what's driving that. Maybe I'm wrong. I would, I would wonder, you know, what's driving that, or would we want to model something in the gross that's that's a driver? Well, I or mean, the we exercise will certainly take into account things we know coming down the line or in the pipeline. Um, but there's also things that we don't know. And so we're left to assume some things and to model, uh, you know, looking forward. Um, I guess it might be helpful if you could articulate, you know, what the purpose of this is. Is it to forecast future tax rates? Is it to understand, you know, model where, you know, uh, uh, whether, investments are shifting from school to town to capital. You know, I think there's a number of different services that can be purposes that can be served here. Right. I think, I think Peter mentioned one, which was if you're looking at a, a, a major new contract, what does that, how, do, how does that impact capital? If you're targeting a, you know, a certain mill rate increase, what, you know, so. Yeah, I, I can add to that a little bit. I mean, I, I think you want to, I, I would caution you against getting too granular with your multi-year projections because you're going to spin your wheels for no real benefit. But where this can come in handy is to help guide those um, negotiations or discussions. If you're looking out three years and you're you're looking at your real growth plus your inflation's three and a half to four um, percent, and you have a contract negotiation that you know is coming up that, that you know they're looking for five or six percent. Well, you know something else is going to have to give, right? So, it, it, in order to, to hit your numbers going down the pike, so um, I think this could actually help inform or uh, enable or help those contract negotiations, or maybe put some parameters around them. I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I you know, start those discussions about well, well how are we going to pay for it? And, you know, I, I guess my suggestion would be, yeah, I think at, at the elementary level, sort of, it was meant to be a, a big picture planning tool. I think the concern was, gee, when we have a $100 million school, if that's what it's going to be, you know, and that debt service comes online and we model where that hits, because I think, Tom, you do model sort of the capital expenditures that we have queued up. It, it kind of gives us a sense of what's coming down the pike. If we see a real spike one year, we can think about the, I mean, so I think it's, and I think once we get this established, we'll be able to dial into it. I think what Tom's request is, and I guess my question to the finance committee, I know this isn't ready for prime time, but is this worth sharing with the town council at the next meeting, just saying, hey, this is, this is a draft of what we're thinking. What do you think? Or do you guys want to kind of go one more round. Tom's asked us to kind of, he's going to redraft it, it sounds like, or update it, Tom? Yeah, I, I, there's some things that we just know now that we didn't then. Yeah. Um, I think it would be probably a mistake to publish something that shows tax rates $2 higher than they actually are. So <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I agree. we got to correct for those known things. Uh, okay. But I'm not opposed to, you know, saying it, uh, providing it out to the council and the public and let's qualify what it is. It's a work in progress, but uh, or, yeah, or we can wait, you know, we can wait until, so we're going to have a one agenda item in September. Um, maybe we can have a later meeting in late September, okay. something this circles back and we can, your request was for us to look at some of the other assumptions to see if yeah. that, yeah, I mean, did, one thing, one thing we will need to tweak for, which I don't know if it's in here, what are the impact of the CEAs by year? I mean, that, that will start to have, especially the downs one where there's, 
mm -hmm. different escalators and different different years the, the funds come due. Yeah, you know, you'll see we've grown it, but uh, you know, have we grown it appropriately? It, it appears to be going up about fifty thousand dollars a year. That's probably not accurate. Okay. Um, you think it would be helpful to provide? not just this sheet, but where we are actually, at least for FY20 and 21, so we can see a comparison of what we assumed yeah, that'd be compared to what we actually came up with that, that might yeah. help make some adjustments to the assumptions. Yeah, that'd be helpful to look where we're on spot on and where we weren't, although it's unusual events, but. Um, okay. okay, we'll do that. If, yeah, okay. well, just in terms of quick feedback, yeah, I think it's a really good way to go. I mean, it's. It is something we're all familiar with, and maybe someday we get something a lot more sophisticated. But I think it's I think it's good. Yeah, and the, the biggest benefit for is, uh, to me, anyways, comes from having those conversations about where you're going as a town and what's coming. And uh, so that's a great way to start the conversation. Yeah. All right, everybody. There's two agenda items left. Let me very quickly. I, we may not want to discuss them. One is I had put on there COVID funding only to ask, and, and, I, and I don't know what the appetite is. You know, we do have new information. That Tom had referenced the school got 2.1 million. Tom, I think you got good news. You think we're going to get an extra hundred thousand that you hadn't anticipated from state revenue share? Yes. Yes. Um, Does. And so the only reason I have this on here, as we look to set the, the, the rate, the mill rate, do we want to factor, should we factor any of those? You had said the 2.1 million needs to be used between now and December. Correct. Does that impact um, our consider, should it impact our consideration of what our tax request is now that we've got new information? And it's really an open-ended question. I don't know the answer to it, but I think we should at least have that conversation. Well, in this regard, the only thing that would change and, and uh, would be the the five hundred and thirty-five thousand that you've included in school operating for COVID-related costs. I'm not in a position to know whether they need some or all of that in light of this uh, access to other funds. Uh, but at this point, you've adopted and the voters have validated that right. budget for the right. school. So I don't think you can effectively take any of that in consideration in terms of setting the mill rate. What would happen is if some or all of that money is unspent, it becomes fund balance at the end of the year and we'll find a way to cycle that back through to our benefit. Um, you know, I we're going to have a conversation on Monday night about um, how can the town help support the school and its efforts to move forward on this hybrid plan. And in my mind, I would like the school to recognize that we're doing this, at least in part, to assist them and our families. And I wonder out loud, I guess, uh, whether or not any of our efforts to, in that regard, um, can be covered by some of these, some of these funds. Um, I've asked the general question of the school, and I think they're very, I won't say protective, they just don't know what's ahead of them. Yeah, uh, yeah it's understandable. understandably so i don't think they're going to be too quick to commit uh having said that they're very supportive of what we're trying to do because they they hear the pain that the hybrid approach uh, presents to the to the families in town so um i you know this is good news this is far more money than i ever thought we'd, we'd receive frankly and i'm not sure what allocation method they used i think i'm told it was closer to the um, EPS model, but as a minimal receiver, I'm not sure how that works, but I, I'm not going to ask questions because uh, the, the amount of award compared to others does appear to resemble the larger, you know, the larger the district, the more the money. Yeah. Um, so again, good news. And I know my school colleagues are working furiously to find ways, not just to spend this money, but to put this money to use uh, considering all the restrictions that appear to be coming with it. And there is an FAQ that um, is attached by a hot link in, in Kate's memo that you could look on. There's a lot of strings attached to this money. Um, you'll see this hot link at the end here. Um, if you're interested to know more, there's just a lot of regulations that come with it. And so, and, and the time frame is 
curious to me that they've got to flush it through and spend it by the end of December. Seems incredible. But um, so, Tom, you mentioned there may be some um, expenses in FY20 that they could directly apply this. So, if that was done um, and the fund balance they applied to FY21 is greater, um, they could have the same budget that was approved by the voters and that could still lower um, what the taxpayers, uh, the property tax holders um, need to raise uh, for money. So it, it's, you know, it seems like there is a, a component of uh, if this money gets applied to uh, FY20 and that goes in the fund balance and applied to the FY21 school budget that that uh, doesn't change what's being, you know, the budget that was approved. Um, the budget is the budget that was approved by the voters. But if there's more money there, um, then the mill rate could potentially be lower. No, what, no, what about no, no, I don't believe it can be for FY21. I, I think the benefactor would be um, a large fund balance at the end of FY21, which presumably could help buffer uh, any tax rate increase in FY22, because they could put that money going forward. But I don't know of any legal or effective way to affect the tax rate once the budget's set. Well, the, well, the referendum isn't the tax rate, right? The referendum is the amount of money for the schools. It's a yeah. bottom line of what the school get. So yeah. the tax rate is a, is a, is a calculation based on revenue and what the budget's going to be. So if that revenue were no. to increase, no. so no, counselor, no, the tax rate is a is a product of two variables. One, the amount that needs to be raised to support town and school operations, that's the net budget, and the total value of town. And the tax rate's a derivative of those two variables. Right, but I, but but I think the the argument I think that could be used is yeah voters and we approved a total amount the school was going to spend next year, including the 563, whatever the number was for COVID. Right. They've got an extra 2.1 million that they hadn't counted on that the taxpayers are going to. So, I mean, there's some argument and you're right. There may not be a legal argument, but I thought we had said at the beginning of this, that as things came up, we would have, and I don't know if there's an appetite. That's the only, I, I just think we need to have a conversation at this table yeah. about whether there's anything we want to do or not. And, and I understand it, but I bring it up only in the context of, we already know that they've got 1.5 million in surplus. They're already carrying forward. If those numbers hold that we talked about earlier tonight, now an extra 2.1 million, that's a significant you know, roll forward that they're going to potentially have next year. The wild card is what are they going to spend on COVID, which we don't know. Right. If I recall correctly, though, I, I thought they had a caveat in here. You have to use these funds on something that wasn't budgeted. So for the 535 that we already budgeted for COVID for the, um, I think, nurses and bus drivers and whatever the other things uh, were. I, I didn't catch that. I think you give it up. If, if you want to reimburse those, you know, use these funds for that, you don't get, you don't get the funds. Um, which is a really strange way to do it, and uh, but that's the way I read it. So, so say that again, John. They, if they gave up the five thirty six that's in the budget, then they could use the two point one million for that. Is that what you said? No. Well, I, I think you would lose that that funding from the state if you're using it for oh. something that you've already budgeted for. Oh, gotcha. I see what you're saying. Yeah, uh, Liam, if you just scroll up to the first three bullets on that. Okay. So must be used for costs that were previously unbudgeted that were directly caused by the emergency and that will, will not be reimbursed by another funding source. So uh, with all due respect, I think we're talking about something that we don't know, we don't nearly have yeah. enough yeah. answers to. Right. I, I think so. I just want to make one point. So, you know, the, you know, the mill rate is a function of, you know, the budget, which has been approved by the voters that we, we can't change that. They, they, they get the 54 million regardless, whatever the bottom line came to that. 
and it's less the revenue. So you had mentioned that they might be able to apply some of these funds to money that they even spent in FY20, mm -hmm. which might mean that they could carry forward more revenue for FY21, which would reduce the ask of the taxpayer to, uh, you know, once you take the value. So no. the, we didn't vote on a milk rate. So no, the Calvary revenue... I'm sorry, you're, 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 you're just, you're not, you're not correct in that. Um, well, maybe I'm just saying it incorrectly. Um, so, you know, maybe I'm not expressing it correctly, but um, I think, you know, the question is, is that the, we did not vote on a, a mill rate, but the revenue, um, the revenue looks like it could be changing here. The revenue that, um, that is applying going forward to offset what's needed from the taxpayers. But you approved a net budget of the school and the town based on expected revenue. And, uh, and I agree that revenue expectation has changed, but- I, I see what we're talking about different. I'm talking about the referendum. Um, you're talking about the council vote. The council vote can be um, redone is my understanding. The council vote can actually change for, um, because the council vote drove the, drove the uh, the mill rate the what cannot absolutely possibly be changed by law is what the voters approved for the the school budget so I, I see where we're talking about two different things I, I i apologize for that but you know we're getting close i think peter's original question was we're getting close to the very close to the commitment um the the council itself um could take up uh could take up the fact that there may be some additional revenue that could uh, reduce the reduce the ask from the taxpayers. I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I don't agree with that statement. No. Uh, okay, that's fine. We can move on. I, I think the school board would have to make that determination, assuming it was all right to do. That wouldn't be a discussion for us in terms of how much they want to turn back. Right for fund balance, assuming we can even do that, or they can even do that. Right, I, I agree with that. It, I don't think we could decide that. Um, but if there was literally things that this money was gonna disappear, so this isn't my like try to grab at the school, but we were just saying there's a lot of money. John was pointing out maybe that if it's already budgeted, they can't even use it, but you had mentioned that there might be things they spent in FY20 that this money could go towards if that's the case, then it's a potential that that could be applied to uh, FY21 as, as revenue, if it's, especially if it was just gonna go away. So right. I'm no, just, it, and, and I'll encourage them to do that, to be as creative as they can. But, but probably the best way to handle it at this point is to let it flow into fund balance. Yeah. And then, you know, if there's a benefit recognize it in the, in the following fiscal year. Correct. All right. I, I sense we're, we're running out of steam. The last item was executive department restructure. There is some information, but I think this also will be a town council agenda item for a full discussion. I don't know if there's any appetite for having any conversation tonight about it or just table it until, um, we have we it becomes an agenda item i believe don right it's going to be an agenda item for the town council meeting next week uh, i don't know if that uh, been resolved yet i think there was one a placeholder i don't know if that's been confirmed yet or not the draft agenda as it sits and i think as you were all received last night does include uh i, I believe the motions that that you provided peter yes yeah, yeah. So is there any, do people want to discuss this tonight, seeing we're running over, or do you want to have that conversation? And Betsy, yeah, you wanted to say something? Yeah, there was just one quick thing where, you know, John had found the blog post, and then Tom had said we can discuss it tonight. So I was just curious how that that played in the, the COVID communication blog. Um, and I think Tom had said in the quick reply that, you could um, explain how that was working, the three months of the salary for this position. Sure. 
Yeah, I made the decision on my executive department restructuring um, some weeks back. We were invited to apply for additional funding through this COVID awareness campaign. And so we did put in a second round request. Included in that request, um, I included uh, three months of salary and benefits for this new position. Uh, we, we requested about $143,000 in total for all sorts of things. We received uh, notice that we have been awarded 89,000. We don't have clarity as to what was not awarded and we've been chasing it down. And so I can't report on that. Um, but the savings that have been talked about do not include any of that. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Tom, the only, I, and I guess the only clarifying question I just had on this would be, and Liam, congratulations, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. And doing double duty, two hats. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, Tom, the only concern I had is just, you know, just, just logistically, just as we look ahead, we know that, I mean, Larissa was really engaged. Liam was really engaged. You've now combined those two functions into one role and filling it with communications. I'm just concerned. Are we going to be able to have the same expertise in, you know, the, the, depends how, it depends how demanding the finance committee is. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, it's a concern of mine as well. Um, I think you will, if you're not already, you'll be impressed with Liam's um, multifaceted uh, abilities. Uh, more importantly, uh, Larissa, among other things, set up systems that uh, will be legacy systems, like the three-year plan uh, that we just talked about. That's something that, um, thankfully, she helped get off the ground, and um, the rest of us can, can uh, work from it um, you know, going forward. Uh, we also had the luxury of almost a month of crossover. Liam and, and Larissa worked very, very closely on a number of things, uh, including the dashboard. So I think there's good continuity, and we have systems in place that uh, that we intend to continue providing the same level of service to. Yeah, just I mean, so is there any expectation that in the next budget cycle you're going to need to have to backfill staff in either one of the areas? So is not, there at this, not at this point, no. You know, looking forward, we do anticipate some changes in the finance office just with some retirements. And so I think there's, uh, there's future opportunity for us to, and we'll be mindful of what our needs are and we'll be looking to, you know, skill sets to, to see if that can help uh, be supported as well. I see R Ruth looking intently at the screen. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I, I would just add to that. I, I mean, I, I think the executive department, as Tom's to manage, actually, many of the departments are, but the budget is his to manage. And, um, you know, the decisions that he made here, I, I, I fully support. I think they're, they're uh, you know, look forward looking. Larissa was able to bring a, a core set of skills to the table and move us forward in a number of different areas. And I'm sure Leah is going to help us progress forward in um, some similar, but some other areas as well in his new role. And, and hopefully this communications coordinator can can help uh, fill a void uh, that exists. So uh, I think good job. The fact that you can do it and save money, work within your budget is fantastic. Yeah, I, I just think bringing it forward and having a discussion, you know, makes it just an even even stronger thing. Um, I do think, you know, there's, you know, um, I think it's all it all evens out, um, but there there certainly is always going to be a perception in town, you know, if there's a brand new position being created, well, what's that? Well, why would it be now in the, some of the harshest economic times we're seeing? So I, I think it's a very good discussion to have. Um, and uh, I think we're doing the right thing by, um, you know, analyzing it and um, discussing it. And uh, I, I applaud the, um, you know, you know, Tom's, you know, forward thinking um, of, of looking at, re-looking at positions. So with that, um, Liam, do we have any pressing questions or anybody interested in this hung with us for the two and a half hours? That we, we have no, uh, we have no attendees. We're all panelists this evening. <laughs> Let me um, just, let's just check to make. Oh, yeah. No Q and A either. Okay. Oh, there's one chat. What's 
Yeah. Unless I got this Hello. one chat. Okay. Liam, can you stop sharing yeah. screen so we can see? Thank you. So yeah, there's one chat. Did someone check that? Is anything? Uh, it's Don saying hello. Uh, yeah. Hello, Don. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, if any anybody doesn't have anything else, is anybody interested in a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? I guess we can raise our hands. Looks like I can't see something but um thank you everybody for all the work that went into this a lot of information a lot of stuff tonight so thank you very much yes and great work thank you so much all right thanks everyone